Thanks for coming along to a talk which is probably um, a little bit exotic uh, within the rest of this uh, conference, which is mostly about code and technology and things like that. And I'm going to um, hit you with an ancient technology which is using pen and paper um, to actually sketch stuff. Um, and if this presentation has got a part in it where you have to do stuff, and for that, um, it is recommended to have a pen and a piece of paper. It doesn't matter what kind of pen it is, and it doesn't matter what kind of piece of paper it is, but you'll have more fun when you can play along, so be prepared for that. Um, okay. I'll start at the beginning. That's me. My name is Eva Lotta Lam. Um, I'm, I'm German, but I lived in different places. I studied in Cologne, that's the, Colo that's the dome, that's the cathedral of Cologne. Work took, brought me to um, Paris at some point. I lived there for a while. I worked in a small agency doing um, mainly information architecture, some interface design, and then love um, brought me to London. I fell in love with an Englishman and um, I thought after four and a half years of distance relationship, um, living in the same country would be a good idea. Turned out for work it was a good idea as well because there's a, a lot of interesting stuff going on in London. I'm a UX designer, information architect, interface designer, interaction designer, I don't know, there are so many job titles out there right now, but I try to make things that um, work well and look good. And um, the looking good is part of the working well, I think. It's not like about fancy stuff, but the visuals um, help people understand the products that we make, I think. And usually I'm the interface between the people who use the products, like the users, the clients, um, and the people who code the products, like probably most of you guys. So I work a lot um, with users and doing research, and I work a lot with developers explaining my wireframes and my designs and trying to understand what the technical limitations are. So I sit somewhere in between. And I love sketching. Um, I use sketching a lot in my work. When I sketch, it sometimes looks like this. I taught a workshop on Monday about um, using sketching uh, in the design process. Um, maybe a few people in the room we were only a small group, but maybe a couple of people are in the room right now. So I use sketching to sketch like boxes and arrows to, to sketch um, uh, interfaces and flows. This is another example, lots of notes as well, because language is really powerful together with the visuals. I, I'm going to talk about that. Um, I don't only do that alone. I do that with my team and with clients and stakeholders. I invite them into a room with lots of paper and lots of pens and some people are a little bit skeptical in the beginning, like, what, we're gonna draw, can't draw? But um, I use that to pull out requirements from people that they don't write down or talk about that come out when you sketch and to develop ideas together with other people. Um, and I'm always nervous before I do that because when you let people do stuff, you never know what, what you get out of it. But every time, um, the stuff that comes out is better than my fears. And I thought, oh no, nothing is going to happen, and then cool stuff comes out. So that's good. So workshops um, with other people, we sketch a lot of stuff, we pin it on the wall, we talk about it, um, and try to solve problems interactively like that. Um, this is from my workshop that I taught. So these are the lovely people who did this workshop with me um, on Monday. And they know we tried out lots of exercises. It involves uh, sketching, it involves sticky notes, all this kind of stuff. If you have more questions about that, hit me up later, because I like talking about it. Um, so this is mainly what it looks like when I sketch for work work, like for my interface work. Um, sometimes um, that gets zooming out a little bit more because sometimes you actually do want to bring the people back into it, so storyboards and actually having real people interacting with the stuff um, that we make in a real world to bring it back into context. Really good for validating some overall concepts of does that really make sense? Would people use that? Um, and how does it fit in their day? And especially yesterday there was a track about the Internet of Things and the more 
the more th the more Internet of Things things we have in our services and products that we offer, the less screens we'll have. So showing wireframes is a nice thing. But for example, if I have my connected scales and I step on it in the morning and I see the number went up, which is not what I intended, um, that thing communicates to my Fitbit saying, okay, we have to up your step count for today, and therefore you're going to have to work, uh, to walk, I don't know, 20,000 instead of 10,000. Um, and that is kind of a product solution. Well. I can't even make a wireframe for that because the interface on the scale is a number and the interface on here may be a few dots. So if you want to pitch that and explain what the benefit for the customer is, you have to bring the people back in. And storyboards are a great way for that. And um, they don't have to be like as detailed as this. Stick figures are totally fine to kind of explain what is going on um, on a very basic level and they all already trigger understanding and empathy. And we're going to get to that <clears throat> in a bit because everybody can draw. Everybody can, who can hold a pen. Let's put it like that. Um, I also sketch um, uh, outside of work, related to work. When I go to conferences like this, um, I like to take notes. And because my memory is super duper mega rubbish, I um, sketch, uh, I take notes and I sketch my notes. So this is, uh, these are um, notes from a from the Play and Make conference, conference where I went to. Um, this was last week in Amsterdam. I went to a design conference. So it's basically trying to capture the big concepts and sometimes putting an image to it because um, it makes it more memorable for me, for lots of other people as well. And it's more fun to look back at my notes because otherwise I don't look back at my notes if it's just written. Um, these are some notes I did from two talks uh, yesterday. Um, uh, yeah, so it's the proof. Here, here's the sketchbook. I really do them myself, so here you go. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, I make these things into books. I went to loads of conferences over the last few years, and I made a few books um, because I put them all on Flickr for free to look at. Some people like to look at that stuff. Um, but it's nice to have it back on paper, so I made a few books out of them, one for each year, and um, I haven't made a book out of, um, out of the 2013 and 2014 one, but it's coming. I actually do have a... I just want to prove it. I don't know. I don't have to prove you anything, I think, but I always want to prove it. So this is... I prove it to you with a proof copy. Um, I'm doing the last um, final edits on it, like, you know, some color correction and some stuff. So this is the, this is the proof. <laughs> um, it's going to get out. Why, um, why is it so delayed? Actually, that is something um, I wanted to tell you earlier. Yes, um, because I'm going to talk about it. Um, I didn't tell you where I worked. Okay, I worked for, in London, I worked for Yahoo and I worked for Skype and I worked for Google and I freelanced. And after 10 years of working, um, I wanted to take some time off um, because I wanted to go traveling, basically. So um, last November, I just came back from 14 months of backpacking around the world, which was uh, amazing and wonderful and insightful. And I learned a lot, probably a little bit more than uh, during a year in the office. Different things, but very worthwhile for life. Um, and I wanted to get this book ready before we left, but I had to sell a lot of our stuff and that took more time than I thought, so it didn't get ready, so I, I finish it now. Put a deadline on it. Thanks, Rachel. Um, yes, and I told you about my travels not because I want to show off, <laughs> but because the next slide is about that. So I used the same kind of technique um, of uh, writing and sketching to actually um, take notes during my travels because there were so many interesting things happening and so many new food, new people, new animals. Look at this thing. This is a cicada that has, that has kind of a long nose. It's super beautiful. And this is the craziest animal I saw on our trip. This is a freaking flying lizard. The guy we went through the jungle with, he grabbed it off a, off a tree. He was, he was amazing as well, this guy. He was just a jungle man. And then, and then you have this lizard that has, it looks like a, like, a, like a cabbage leaf. And when he threw it away, it just... Now that's only a side note. So I took notes 
um, about all the stuff that, ha that happened and the things that we saw um, and the things that we did and the people that we met. Um, I also do some illustration. That's a, that's a UX book about content management. It's a really good book. Um, I, used, um, I did the illustrations for that, so I do crappy sketches um, before to kind of get the content, uh, the, con the concept straight with the illustrator, and then it goes into full-blown illustration. So that is not sketching anymore. This is illustration. This takes a long time. This is refinement. Um, and then you have a set of illustrations for that. So this was just little context of what I do. So you see, I love pen and paper, and I love making marks on paper, from really simple arrows and boxes to the full-blown thing. So, um, but I want to talk about sketching uh, and basically making spatially, spatially distributed marks on paper that are not letters that explain something in your head. Either it explains it to yourself or it explains it to somebody else. And um, it is super useful. Um, so why, why, why should we sketch? And one thing that really strikes me is we are super professional in consuming visual information. And more and more of the information that we consume is visual. It is in the airport, icons in the airport, we know where to go. Um, continues in the plane, know how to behave when shit hits the fan. Um, <laughs> we, we just consume visuals so often and so naturally, sometimes with uh, difficulties, sometimes without, um, but the difficulty is not in the explanation, it's, it's always missing a piece. Um, and the interface itself, like the, the visual desktop metaphor, is a visual metaphor from the real world. We use icons, we navigate our virtual worlds with visuals as well. And we're so proficient in that because we're freaking visual animals. That's how we understand the world in the first place. Um, but when it comes to producing and expressing ourselves visually, there's, a, there's kind of a problem because um, sketching and drawing is either for children or it's art. And there's not much in between. It's like as a child, everybody sketches and then they stop because they don't produce art. Um, and it's not good enough, and it's not beautiful, and whatever. But there's a freaking big span in between these two. And there's a lot of space to do really cool stuff, and to do really useful stuff. Not really cool, but useful. Most of all, useful. Um, and um, so, useful for expressing yourself and for clearing your thoughts. So what we all do, we all talk. This is German, it means apple. Um, and we, in school, we all learn to write to express ourselves. That's fantastic. These are two levels that are really great to express ourselves. But I see sketching and expressing yourself visually just as another layer. It's not there to replace everything else. Um, but it is when you learn how to sketch, then you just have a third level or like a new language at which you, with, that you can use when the other two sometimes fail or to enhance it. That's how I see it. Um, and with learning how to write, that's the interesting thing. It's, um, we learn how to write in school, but we don't really learn how to sketch. Um, drawing is always in the art department. But um, if you compare sketching to writing, I would say like we, with sketching, it's the same thing. We teach people to write, but if we told people, well, now you can write, but you're only uh, allowed to write poems, um, high literature, and theater plays, um, but you're not allowed to, uh, to write shopping lists. That's the same with sketching. It's like there's a lot of space between Shakespeare and the shopping list in sketching as well. Sketching is not for producing only art. It is the equivalent of the shopping list is totally fine. And sometimes a sketch just um, explains things much more obviously, much more directly. Everything that has something to do with relations, with relationships, especially spatial relationships, but also functional relationships, human relationships, I can tell you that sketching is a really powerful tool to show relationships because you have a two-dimensional space. You can connect things, you can show connections, and you can show which things belong together and which things don't belong together. Um, and one thing that happens when you sketch as well, which makes it really magical, 
is um, you get some kind of a visual feedback loop. That is something really cool that happens, um, and I'll tell you how it works. So this is me at the beginning of the project, or my thought process. I'm s my page is empty, that's horrible, and I'm so stressed out that I lost my hair. Um, and I have a thought, I have a great thought, um, but it has to get out of my head, and it has to get onto the page at some point, because um, uh, because then the magic can start to happen. When you visualize something, especially um, when you put it um, spatially distributed on a paper, something amazing happens. You can look at it and you can reflect and evaluate what you just did. You can see, oh, something is missing or, oh, there's not enough space between the two things or, um, oh, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't work. Um, there are lots of things that you see um, and they produce new thoughts. And then you can visualize it. You can put the things that you missed. You can cross out the things that were too many. You can put in the connections that are needed. Um, and you can then reflect and evaluate again. Great, fantastic, magic cycle. And if you are familiar with lean development and agile and things like that, this might look very familiar. Because in, uh, in lean development, well, we build kind of, or lean design, we build stuff. We measure if it had the outcome that we wanted. Uh, we learn something from it, and based from that, we build something else, or we, we changed what we built. And you can have this super-duper mega goodness already before touching a line of code, just by yourself, by sketching. It's exactly the same process. One of my design heroes, um, he says, the making influences the thinking. I agree. Um, and a little bit of science, because science is always good. Um, uh, there are lots of people who looked at um, what happens when we look at images and uh, words and how we process images and words and if there's a difference and if it makes a difference for learning. And one of the things um, that came out of uh, this research is something called the dual coding theory. Basically, I mean, I'm breaking it down like really simple. It's more complex than that, but yeah, you know, it's a conference. Um, so roughly, we process images and words on two different channels. They are processed differently in our brain and they are two different channels. Um, the visual is the analog channel. Um, no, no real um, translation needed. When I look at a picture of an apple, it looks like the apple itself. So it's fairly direct, fairly quick, really cool. Um, and then language, it's the symbolic channel. You need um, a code to decode what it is because the uh, relationship between the word, there's no direct relationship to the actual thing. It's completely random. Somebody chose it at some point. And if you don't have the code, then you have a problem because you have no possibility of going back to what the original thing was. But language is really good. In, uh, in some areas, language allows us to be uh, absolutely crazy detailed. That's super duper cool, because if you wanted to sketch these different, different types of apples, it's basically impossible. So for detail, language is great to complement um, sketches or images. Um, and on the other side, we can also open it up to absolutely abstract concepts and things that don't even exist yet. Um, everything that goes beyond the physical world, um, language absolutely powerful to complement to complement the visual channel. And so these things run on these two channels, which is super interesting because you can, you can um, put a visual next to, um, next to uh, the verbal thing and they work in parallel together. You can compute them at the same time. Like for example, you can watch, uh, you can look through, um, uh, through a photo book of, I don't know, nature photos and process that while having a conversation with somebody else and, and you understand both. But try to read a novel, it goes in through the eyes, not through the ears, but it's words, and have a conversation with somebody else. Two things on one channel, it just doesn't work. So these visual and verbal complement each other super, super well. And it's important to find the right, ba right balance between images and words. Um, it's not about shifting everything to words. Um, not about shifting everything to, um, uh, or to images or to words, it's about finding the balance. And starting small, totally okay. Um, I showed you these uh, notes that I make, and when you look at um, 2009, 
Uh, my lo notes look very different. That was kind of my humble beginning of that. You know, there are some icons in there and some little visuals, um, but uh, nearly, nearly not as much as here. Um, you get better with practice. And even in a short amount of time, you have to groove yourself in. Like this was at the beginning of our trip, and that was 11 months in, in my diary, and I don't know, I can see a slight difference in kind of how it happened. So starting small, totally fine. How am I doing for time? Fantastic. Okay. Um, and this is a very good place to start when you want to start small, and we're gonna actually start in a minute and actually do some stuff. So um, I do take notes at conferences and the advantages, I can pick out the things that interest me and just note them down. Sometimes in a work environment, mm, I have to take more detailed notes. These are notes from some field research that we did. So basically you go out and visit people in their homes and you look at how they use a certain piece of technology and ask them stuff about it. They show you stuff and um, Usually you have a video camera to film them uh, because you can go back and make a nice little video for other people to share later. Um, but also you take some notes because it's a shortcut. If you, if you visit 10 people for two hours, then you have 20 hours of video. That's a long thing to review to pull out things. But um, you have to take some notes. So I take these notes. You see there's a lot of text, but there's also a few visuals. And um, this is just for you to learn German. I don't know, I think I forgot to translate this slide. <laughs> but um, basically, there are a few icons that are repeatedly used just to structure my notes. Because the amazing thing is that we're really good at spotting patterns and we're really good at spotting shapes. Much better than kind of fast reading and spotting words because we don't have to read. So I use things like when there's a direct quote, from the person like up here. Um, I use these massive um, quote signs. If there's a problem, um, he talks about a problem and things that, that are going wrong with the technology, I uh, do this flash. Um, if there's an idea that this person has what we could do or I have while I'm listening to him, a little light bulb and then just some happy and some uh, unhappy smileys for good and bad points that they bring up with the technology. And that makes my notes instantly scannable. And I use that for meetings as well. It's really cool, it really works. And it's a very good place to start just to inject tiny, um, tiny icons in your written notes, assuming that you still use written notes. But I think written notes are, um, I don't always have my computer with me, especially, especially in these situations in a meeting. I hate it when everybody has their computer up and sits there. It is much, a much softer approach to just have a little notepad. Um, okay, so I talked a lot. Now it's your turn, or oh, our turn. I mean, like, you're not alone. Um, okay. I wanted, to, I wanted to have a little camera so that you can see my hand while I'm drawing, but for several reasons this didn't work out, doesn't matter. I'm gonna, I have this little tablet that I'm gonna sketch on, so you're not gonna, it's like a ghost sketching, so you're not gonna see my hand, you're only gonna see, um, you're gonna see the stroke, but it's gonna be fine. Okay, we'll start like good athletes with a little warm up, because um, important, important to get kind of the groove. Um, Okay, so let me try and do the magic. Boom, magic. Okay, we're going to start super, super simple, and it really makes sense to, to do that, although it might seem silly. Silly things sometimes are good. Okay, we're going to start with the simplest thing that I can do as a mark on paper, which is simplest thing I can sketch. A circle is too complicated for me. A dot, I like you. Good, let's do some dots. Dots are really cool to kind of warm up the wrist, get the hand going. You can make like kind of a dot cloud, try to make them evenly spaced so that when you squint your eyes, it's a nice even gray, no lumps, no holes. You can arrange them in a line, evenly spaced, dotted lines, super, super cool, super useful. Um, okay, after we had some dots, um, how about continuing on to the next thing, which is connecting two dots, some lines. Uh, 
We'll do some lines. Just start with some lines, some straight lines. This thing is a little bit slippery, so my lines will be probably more wonky than yours. Some horizontal lines, you can try to keep them parallel and evenly spaced. You can make them longer, you can make them shorter, you can make some vertical lines. What I Sometimes when I have problems with wonky lines, for some people it can help to kind of pull the line towards you, like when you, when you start away from you and then pull towards your belly button, it is e sometimes easier co to control the line than pushing it the other way around or doing it parallel. You can always turn your paper, that's the advantage when you have a piece of paper. But that's just a thing to, to try out, especially when you have a very long line. Okay, cool. Some lines. Um, so uh, I'll select all and then I'm gonna... Ha. Okay, so we had some lines, now we want to do um, something out of the lines, combining lines into shapes. Simplest shape I can make out of lines. Square, nope. Triangle, triangle, yes. So, I make some triangles. I want you to watch for one second. I want, what I, what I don't want you to do is, uh, is this. What I want you to do is this. It's hard to see because you don't see my hand, but the difference is I lifted my pen after each stroke. And why do I do that? It's because then it becomes super clear that a line is a line and that it's not some kind of a, an accident and some kind of a weird shape. Even if the corners overlap, it doesn't matter, then it's clear it's a corner and not just some, I don't know what. So yeah, some triangles. You can do unilateral triangles, you can do long triangles, you can do um, other kind of triangles. Geometry uh, lovers amongst you know all the technical terms. I only know them in German. Um, go out of your comfort zone in terms of size. We have kind of a natural size we sketch stuff in. When I say make a triangle, it will probably come out the same size every time you do it. So do some smaller ones and do some really big, badass freaking triangles. Come on. Yes. Just to show your hand that it can move in different ways that it never moved before. Here we go. Okay. So triangles. We'll move on to the four-sided triangle, also known as square. Same thing applies. Lift your freaking pen after each stroke. Make nice corners. You can make long ones, like humongous buttons. You can make tiny ones, which are like little check boxes. Bigger ones, which are like a phone screen maybe. Even bigger ones, which are like a long uh, scrolling website. Rectangles are amazing. Good. Again, different sizes, always good. Um, and last but not least, everybody's favorite shape, the perfect circle. <laughs> um, again, tiny circles like coming out of the fingertips, like little bubbles or little radio buttons, and then medium-sized and super-duper big badass circles. The bigger they get, the harder it is to make them really circly. There's no, there's no real... Um, trick to perfect circles. It's practice and observing what went wrong in the previous circle and trying to correct it with the next. If you always do your circles clockwise, try doing them anti-clockwise, just for the fun. Whoa. See what happens, how it feels, very different. If you always start them on the top, try starting them on the bottom and doing them the wrong way around and huge. Oh my God, new universe of feelings in my hand immediately. Okay, good. Um, that's it. That's the circles. Um, we're back in the room. Okay, I hope your hand is a little bit warmed up. We'll do another bit in a second. I just want to clear up my sloppy language and everybody's sloppy language, but I'm guilty as well. Sketching is not the same as drawing, although we use these words interchangeably many times. Um, sketching is about communicating ideas things that are in our head that we want to share. It's not about creating detailed portraits of the world, like um, drawing naked people or still lifes or something. It's not about that, it's about ideas. Illustrating that, it's a really cool graphic from a book called um, Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud, who's a comic artist. 
Um, maybe you know his work. When Google came out with the Chrome browser, they made a, a comic where they had interviewed lots of engineers explaining how the Chrome browser worked. Scott McCloud was the comic artist who did that. He also made a book about how comics work and how comic artists use visuals and words to kind of tell stories. And that's this book, Understanding Comics. The cool thing is it's a comic about how comics work. So it's all explained in a comic. Um, this is from this book. And here we go in German, of course, <laughs> from realistic to abstract, which is from a detailed portrait to an idea. Um, so we don't want to, we don't need to be in that realm where we um, kind of recognize the guy. We want to be on this other side and you can see we don't need many shapes for that. We practice basically all the shapes that we need to get an idea across, um, which are these, like a dot, a line, triangle, square and circle. It's like Lego. When you know these, you can put them together in different ways and you can make everything anything, things that exist, things that don't exist, it is amazing. And we're going to do exactly that. All righty. Uh, back, back to my beautiful circles. Goodbye. All right. So I talked about, I just want to sketch some stuff with you, um, li like using this method of um, putting simple shapes together. And I'm gonna, just gonna, we're just gonna do some stuff that might be helpful when you're kind of taking notes in a meeting or standing up on the whiteboard and planning out the next project. So um, sometimes it happens that you have an idea and we often use a light bulb. So if you break that down into the Lego theory of sketching, I usually start with a little rectangle. You, you are allowed to sketch along, that would be super duper fun. And then, I attach a circle to the top of it. You already know where we're going. And then, um, like a little triangle, you can also make this line squiggly if it's like an old school one. Um, you can add some lines here in the bottom to kind of show that it's a screw in one. I know that in Britain they sometimes, they have those ones, you know, they, they are kind of, they click. They have those, but I don't like them. I come, I, I am, I'm used to those. Okay, and you can add some lines um, if actually somebody's at home and uh, the light bulb can be on. So I use that a lot for ideas. Um, sometimes ideas um, can turn into problems and actually you can see that we are using the same thing as before, but now I'm adding slightly different lines And my idea turns into a warning sign. Um, I use that sometimes for, for big problems. If the problem is smaller, I just use this little flash that I sh showed, which is basically like a, um, like a zigzag line, um, and then connect it just to another zigzag line that kind of meets the line down here. And that's, uh, I use that for problem a lot. Like I usually then just fill it out. It's nice and visible. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Super easy. Um, ah, action items. When you're in a meeting, you want people to do stuff or you have to remember that you have to do stuff. Um, and that's, um, uh, I, I usually, I, I, like, um, I like doing little stars. But it's quite hard to do a five-edged uh, five star um, just freehand. So there's a trick for that. If you start with a V upside down, and then you add like writing an A, but a little bit higher, like a long line here, like the arms and the legs, and then you connect this arm to this leg and the other way around, which is this. And then you fill it in and you have a wonderful, wonderful star. And after some time, you can do that in one go, if you, if you um, practice it a bit. And at some point, you can, you can just do the outline. Um, another, thing, um, another thing that I use a lot is, um, I have to look it up. I have them here, it's my cheat sheet. Oh yes, milestones and goals. Um, a little rectangle with a stick on it. 
is a fantastic little flag. Great for a milestone, but this could also be like all kinds of other things. It's maybe a little ambiguous and a bit little simple. If you just, if you take um, the top and the bottom part and just turn it into a little wavy line, I make two wavy lines, and then you connect them, then you have a much more lively flag. That's an amazing little flag. That's a much nicer life milestone. There's some wind going on. It's not static. It's not stale. If you want to turn that into a goal, well, you can do the same thing. You can do a little flag, and then you just add more wavy lines and some straight lines. And if you're a Formula One fan, you can make it put the color in. And that's a fantastic goal. So if you're planning on the whiteboard and planning, using these little icons, it will guide your eye later um, much more easily over the whiteboard. And you have a little fun because it's not just all dry words. So you can even, if you like, if it's a really, if it's a really amazing goal and it's really hard to achieve, you can put your little flag on top of a mountain. Yeah, and then we have to go all the way up there. Oh, but imagine when we stand up there. Yes, it's going to be freaking ace. So, um, yeah, a mountain is a triangle. Sometimes there are two triangles. Boom. Really easy. The Alps are close. Um, another thing that sometimes happens um, on the way to this marvelous goal is there are some hurdles and things that don't go well. Um, a hurdle like very simple, it's a rectangle connected. It's a little bit like this flag, but with, a, with another leg. And then, uh, and then like the things that it stands. And here's my hurdle. Oh, I don't like, I don't like obstacles. Um, so the, the goal is that we can jump over it. Ding, 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 ding. That's what we want to do. Um, I can um, also, if I want to have a little bit more fun, I can turn, I can kind of um, tilt my rectangle like this and put the feet back on and then I have a three-dimensional hurdle. That's even cooler than the two-dimensional hurdle. And then you can have like there are lots of hurdles on the way. I hate that. Here we go, hurdles. I like using that a lot as well. Um, you can also use this, you can use this basic hurdle as well if you, you can use that um, you can use that for almost anything. Like, for example, it can be, it can be the starting line, or it also can be your finishing line. I have one tip which I which I haven't um, used right now. But if you do text in a box, always do the text, and then do the box. Um, I've, I, I knew what I was, was writing, but usually the, the idea is, or the, the rule is, no matter how big you ma make the box, the text will never fit in, fi in at least 50 to 80% of the time. It's really annoying. So first the text, then the box. The same is true for speech bubbles. First the speech, and then the bubble. That is why it's called speech bubble and not bubble speech. Um, speaking of speech bubbles, a speech bubble is basically... Um, it's basically an oval with a little triangle, and at some point you don't have to make the connection anymore because you just integrate the triangle in it. Speech bubbles are great because they can have all kinds of shapes. When they are like little clouds, they are more like thoughts. When they are square, they can be more like um, really firm statements. So you can play with the shape of it to kind of use that as well as icons. I use that a lot. Um, and uh, how are we doing for time? All righty, I have a few minutes, so I'll um, do a little bit more. Um, oh yeah, and when we have a benefit, sometimes things go well, and there's a, well, there's a benefit or something really good happening. Um, if you do a triangle, and then you put three little triangles on top of the triangle, one, two, three, and connect them on the top like this and then you take the connections here and you can see what that is I mean that's a little bit wonky but if I do that again you can see this is a fantastic shiny diamond and that's all the time when there's something I don't know when you start making money or when a unique selling point 
that's kind of, that's the diamond you want to do. And if you practice, like with all these icons, it's like learning how to write. Remember in the beginning when you started to learn how to write and it was like, oh, an R, yeah, I tell you how, how you do an R. It's like a vertical line and then it's like, okay. And then it's like, oh, it's a curve. Urgh. Oh, God. And then it's another line. And in the beginning you were super slow and it was super hard and you thought like, what the freak, there are 26 different one of those. I mean, you can make more things in terms of doing little icons, but honestly, believe me, if you practice these icons like 50 times, and then you keep using them, you're just banging out diamonds in no time, like you're, like you're writing. Um, and um, yeah, and uh, with that, um, I'm actually not gonna come to the last point because it, to the last, to the theoretical point, that's way too boring. We have a little bit more time. Does anybody have, an re have a request for something that they always wanted to sketch and they don't know how to do it? Ah, okay, emotions and faces. Here we go, quick emotions and faces thing. Make a big badass square and subdivide it into nine sub-squares like tic-tac-toe. And then into each square, make two dots and an L so that you have like a basic face, like two eyes and a nose. Dun, dun, dun. We have to hurry up a bit, but um, we can do it. Ding, 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 ding. Here we have nine faces. Now, it's the face matrix. It's the most scientific thing I've ever done. Um, above each column here, I'll put a shape. So here I put an arc opening to the bottom, an arc opening to the top over the second column, and a straight line over the third. And then I do the same next to each row, next to the first row, arc opening to the bottom, second row, arc opening to the top, and um, straight line. And now I fill out my matrix. I go from top to bottom in each column. I pick up the shape, this arc, and put it above the face and go down, down, down. Then I go to the second column, pick up the shape and put it above the face and pick up the shape, put it above the face. And now I do the same with the rows from left to right. Pick up the shape and put it below. Doing, doing, doing. Um, Similar thing, do, do, and do, do, do. Okay, and what we see is I have the same dude. Wow, I have, I have, I have um, special effects. But when you look on your paper, you don't need mine. You can see that you have the same dude in nine very different uh, states. And um, what you, you don't have to keep the eyebrows connected. You can actually detach them. Like, but, the, but the two important things when you're, when you're sketching emotions is um, <coughs> placing, placing two eyes and nose and then a mouth and eyebrows in different variations. And you can start playing around with it. You'll find some good expressions in there. And with that, um, I'll leave it to the next speaker. And I hope you'll go out and... Sketch a bit at some point. <laughs>